Wednesday, November 20, and we have a great show here for you. The news headlines, the weather report, and today in history. This morning, Wilson's Legacy, a story about a boat that touched a thousand. But first, I would like to take this moment to thank Not Your Average Antiques, an antique shop down Cranberry Highway in East Wareham for donating the props that you see in the morning show. So stay tuned because the news headlines and the weather report are next. More than 200 people came out to the Grace Lighthouse Fellowship Church for a free Thanksgiving meal on Saturday after the church expanded its outreach campaign for the annual event. The holiday feast, including turkey and all the fixings, was served to hundreds of people in need across Wayham. Pastor David Buguri said that the church has been working to expand its annual outreach over the last three years. And every middle school student at Wayham Public Schools is getting extra life lesson when it comes to e-cigarettes and the dangers of vaping. Health School Harriet Sullivan is teaching 7th graders about techniques to resist peer pressure, the dangers of drug use and misleading advertising tactics. The curriculum is part of the Catch My Breath program which was developed by the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health to equip students with the knowledge and skills they need to make informed decisions about the use of e-cigarettes. The classes are a nine-week commitment. Also, St. Patrick's Youth Ministry has recently started a new community outreach to offer support to the residents of the local nursing homes. Following a pumpkin painting event in October with residents of all American assisted living at Wayham, the youth ministry bought turkey crafts and stuffed animal gifts to Tremont Rehabilitation and Skilled Care Center. In the spirit of the season, the youth ministry will soon host a Christmas party. Visitors are welcome to attend on Sunday, December 15th, after the 10 um, a.m. Mass. Uh, that is 10 a.m. local time in the parish center, 82 High Street, Wayham. For more information, please contact St. Patrick's Church. Also, Slice of Heaven will be giving away free frozen turkeys with all the fixings to families in need to cook on Thanksgiving. Those who need the turkeys should contact the restaurant um, directly. And that is all this morning news headlines. And now we're going to take a look at our weather forecast. Okay, cloudy out there with occasional rain showers. High at 43 degrees and this is as high as it's going to get. And lower 32 degrees. Thursday, tomorrow, sunny with high at 49. We're still going to be in the 40s. The exception here is that we are going to feel some sun on our skin. We are looking at 34 for a low. And that is all this morning's weather forecast. And right now we're going to take a look at an Eagle Scout story. In honor of Veterans Day, a local Eagle Scout reveals his project. A gift of fellowship, a eulogy to retired American flags. I selected to build this fire pit for the American Legion Hall for the veterans. And it benefits the veterans and the Boy Scouts so we could have flag burning ceremonies. Keep right on moving. Yeah, once it's stopped, now. Ready? just keep right. going. Keep right on moving. And right in moving. In. Drop. In. Drop. In. Drop. In. Drop. In. Beautiful. Good job, guys. Gonna go up quick. Uh, Adding to his fellow Eagle Scouts idea of establishing flag boxes across town, the fire pit is a place 
to ceremoniously incinerate flags. So could you please tell us about the process of um, helping them to select a, a project and uh, having it come to fruition as what we are witnessing here today? Yeah, so a lot of times when the scouts come to us with some ideas for some of their Eagle Scout projects, um, they'll work with uh, someone from the committee or another one of the adult leaders to kind of coach and guide that scout through the process. And once they come up with an idea, um, they'll actually bring that idea to the troop. So he had to come with some numbers, some cost estimates, some hours and the amount of time and the impact on the community that the project would actually have. Now, could you tell us about during this process, um, what are some vital skills that you learned that you feel you will continue taking them to other projects as you continue with the Eagle Scout or just in, in your personal life? Well, doing this Eagle Scout project, I have other kids in my troop that are going to be doing their Eagle project soon. And I feel like doing this will be able, I will be able to show and provide information that they might need to help with their Eagle project because they're alike in a few different ways and they aren't in some others. Now that the project is complete, paperwork still need to be submitted to the national level office before Dougie receives his Eagle Scout. So in, in the future, when uh, people need to retire their flags, what will be the protocol? Well, there's, there's numerous collection points around the town. There's some at the, at the Department of um, Maintenance Department. There's boxes in the town hall, just like the one out front. And when the people's flags are no longer uh, useful, they fold them up and throw them there. And then throughout the year, they, they have these um, procedures and ceremonies to, 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 to um, decommission the flags. I hope you enjoyed that. So we are going to our next program of the day, and that is Finding You Century. Take a look. Faced with the need and the passion to give back, a brother and sister merged their talents and took action. They founded Finding You Sanctuary, a nonprofit rescuing dogs to help support veterans living with post traumatic stress. Um, the first thing I do is I help people connect with their dogs and the dogs connect with their people. And once that they have done that, then I show them how to read their emotional state of mind and how that, once that happens, you can change what you do because change is inevitable to change what we don't like to see. So after that, then we have the connection to our soul, which is what we all want, to feel at peace, to have joy again. With decades of experience as a dog behavior specialist, Lean has a unique method of working with misunderstood dogs. Through her success-proven method, a veteran with PTS can find common ground with a rescued dog. Yes, I work with the dogs that are so misunderstood, and aggression is the biggest one. But dogs have a big reason for being aggressive. It's what we show them the way, and dogs follow as a pack member does. So the leader, which is usually the human, hopefully, um, when we become have issues or things don't work out right, the way we treat them, um, nice, good, indifferent dogs follow us, and they learn from us. The biggest need that I found was that veterans with PTSD, uh, their biggest issue is the trust and respect. They need us to respect them so that they can learn to trust and be with us. And their healing, I know, will begin if they can be with dogs that are almost like them. And that's how you pair them. Dogs will choose most of their owners if we allow that. And the ones that choose us usually the ones that make us work the hardest to be with them because of their behavior. And aggression, fear, uh, insecurities, it's a very big deal with both misunderstood dogs and veterans. Finding You Sanctuary has two main objectives, 
reducing the rate of canine euthanasia and improve the coping skills of veterans within their new reality. So in Massachusetts alone, there are 80,000 uh, diagnosed cases of PTSD. Uh, there's several different types of uh, emotional wounds or inner wounds. And then there's TBI, which is traumatic brain injury. Uh, and then there's uh, MST, which is military sexual trauma, which uh, most of us would be surprised to hear that 50% of those reported cases are actually male. So there's a lot of issues out there. And what Lynn is able to do, helping people and dogs have a deep connection, and then the dog mirrors the emotional state of the person. The one thing I do see um, is that what animals are so capable of, and that's letting everything go, being in the moment. What I see with veterans is huh, how amazingly strong they are, how amazingly giving they are, how they have probably the best understanding of camaraderie, how to work together, how to be in the community. They are amazing as far as giving. And for me, I don't know, I've just seen that Veterans with PTS is the biggest thing for me to watch is to help them, help themselves by using animals. It's just my biggest thing that that's what I see. Once funding is established, the barn will be transformed into a space that will foster the program in addition to housing rescue dogs. And we have a multi-fold mission. Mm -hmm. uh, one is if you care about dogs and wish to rescue Help them. To work with that. The yeah. other one is if you care about veterans and wish to give back to them, uh, serve those who have served us. Um, we also plan on eventually expanding into first responders and so on. Um, and then there's uh, those who believe that there's uh, a connection that needs to be made with the community at large because it's not just the veteran, it's also their family and friends and all the people around them are affected by what they've done while they're in ser uh, service and when after that back. point. Yeah. So there's, there's three right there. And then the other one is just an overall connection, person to person, mm -hmm. animal or person to nature, and the dog is that connection and the way through to that. And that's what Lynn is special about helping people uh, find that connection. For more information about finding new sanctuary, please visit them online to find out how you can help veterans earn peace at home. Well, let's take a break, and when we come back, we're going to continue with more. Today's cell phones are not only an extension of our arms, but a life tool. Hello. I am Maureen Farrington from Advantage Custom Apps. I am here today to talk about a certain app, a tool that will help you navigate your way through the Wareham community. The WCTV app places your local community in the palm of your hand. The app is a place where you will find local events, town meetings, local and school sports, community interest stories, compelling interviews, and most of all, the ability to shop local. Connect to the Wareham app by going to your web browser and typing in wctv.app. And then, once you bring up the web link, you have the opportunity of adding WCTV's app to your home screen. Once you download the app and save it to your home screen, you will then have the opportunity to, with the touch of a finger, hit the call button, which we call WCTV, the refer us button. You can refer the app to your friends and families. There's a Facebook share button if you'd like to put that on your Facebook page as well. And here is the menu tab. On the menu tab, we have YouTube videos, new program proposal, events that WCTV is hosting, a photo gallery, contact button, and can lead you right to their website. We also have an, a shop local tab. When you touch on that, you'll see the local businesses that you can frequent. Also, there's an About Us tab telling you some information about WCTV. There are hours and directions. This here will take you right to their Facebook page. 
There is a donate button if you would like to donate to WCTV and a join button that will let you join their community. Many local establishments are listing their business on the WCTV app. And you can too. It's a great way to showcase your business to your existing customers and your potential new ones. For a nominal fee, you could list your business on the Shop Local tab as well. A percentage of that fee goes to fund a scholarship for an outgoing senior. So be in the now and get the WCTV app on your home screen. Welcome back. So there are a lot of great programs taking place at the Gleason Family YMCA right here in Wayham. One of them is the youth basketball program of all ages. Um, and so I was there last week. I sat down with the program director to learn more about what this program is and how it transcends to just learning about the, the game. So take a look. Day. Man, I've been going hard, trying to make it up the boulevard, find a way for me and my squad, mama always said I was a star, yeah, I've been going hard, trying to make it up the boulevard, find a way for me and my squad. So this is the clinic, could you explain what that is? Uh, so we typically do YBL, which is our youth basketball league here at the Y. 
Um, I came in last year in February in the middle of the league, um, and then our spring league kind of fell apart a little bit just because we have a lot of other leagues we're competing with. Um, so we turned it more into a skills clinic, which uh, was really popular. We also have a Thursday night clinic kind of working on those same skills. Um, we brought it back this fall, um, same thing, but we also have now uh, close to 30 people in each of our hour-long uh, clinics. So um, we really are trying to work with those kids on you know the fundamentals of basketball, but also you know being a good person. And that's what we're focused on here because we're all about youth development here at the Y. Um, so we're just kind of focused on building that basketball as a whole, also the individual as a whole. Now this particular clinic, it's a whole separate program. It's it doesn't. It's not part of the membership, the regular membership. No, it's not. So we charge for the rookies right now. We have for uh, five to seven year olds, we charge fifty dollars for members um, and a hundred dollars for non-members, which is a twelve-week program. So it's every Saturday for an hour, um, and then for the next clinic that starts at noon, we have um, eight to twelve year olds, and that really works on the same skills, um, just a little bit older. So we're kind of breaking it down a little bit more, um, and that's a uh, hundred dollars for members and one hundred fifty for non-members. Um, again, it's twelve week. It's a twelve-week program every Saturday. Now, what kind of kids are you looking for, and what about disabilities and so forth? Um, so right now, it's really anybody's welcome to come in, whether you know you're a seasoned player or you're just starting. Um, a lot of the kids we have here, especially in the rookies, um, they're new to basketball, so it's just working on those skills. And then uh, for our older league, we have some kids who have played for a while, um, but we really want to still work on those skills because you're only going to get better working going forward. Um, and then in our 12-year-old clinic, we also um, we have a student who has Down syndrome. Um, he does really well with the clinic. He goes to high school, so he joins in that program, and he plays on the unified basketball team. So we're really open to anybody, um, and we can work with anybody on those skills too. So are you looking to recruit more students, more kids? Uh, yes, yeah, so right now we really want to turn this into a league um, in January, the second week of January it'll start back up another 12 week, it'll go to March. Um, we really were hoping to get a league going, which is what it used to be. Um, that's what we're looking for right now. Um, and if not, we're going to continue with this clinic. Um, we have a clinic in December, actually, right after Christmas. It'll be a three-day, three-hour clinic a day, working on the same things with the same coaches, um, just working on those skills and helping those kids get forward, go forward with it. And how would you t tell this, present this to parents, especially those who are not into sports and they feel like their kids may not like it? How do you present the argument that they will get more than just learning how to play the game? So here at the Y, like I said, we're all about youth development. So we don't really just focus on the skills of basketball, but we're also, we also want those kids to have fun. And we also want those kids to you know, have some uh, physical literacy so, so they know how to stay healthy going forward, whether they stick with the sport or not. You know, They're learning how to like get that strength and conditioning training, but also and you're working with a lot of other kids. So you got to work on how to get along with other people. And we're building that up, um, building up the individual as a whole rather than just focusing on basketball focusing on those skills that's me that's a big part of it but it's also you know we want those kids to become good people so that's kind of my argument to come to the Y in general not even just for basketball but any program we have we really want to focus on building up the child as a whole in youth development Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next plan better than my last plan. Culmination is the last stand. It's the Royal Rumble. Last and I'll be going man. hard. Trying to make it out the boulevard. Find a way for me and my squad. You could you could potentially get a scholarship when you're older, and that could give you a full ride. It all depends. But me with basketball, that that was like an escapism for me when I was younger. You know, going through problems and stuff like that. Like I would just go to the court, play basketball, and that would take away my worries and stuff like that. But it made a lot of friends too. I got to travel all around the East Coast and stuff like that. So that's what I feel like basketball presents. That was delightful. And speaking of delightful, we are going to take a look at Plymouth Winery, 1620 Winery located in Plymouth, to talk about their business, how they got started, and what they have. Take <laughs> winery and it's also a love story because you guys are married yes and you decided that being married is not enough 
Let's do business together. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about how you got started. So, <laughs> I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> Bob and I have worked together for over 18 years, and we were in the healthcare industry for 15 of those. We decided that 15 years is long enough, mm -hmm. and we decided to sell the company. Through that year-long process, neither one of us knew what was next. We didn't know what we were going to do next. One thing they were certain of was Robert's passion for winemaking, the grandson of a Sicilian winemaker. Wine making has been Robert's lifelong obsession. So when he discovered that both a small winery on Plymouth waterfront and a large mill building in Cottage Park were available, he seized the opportunity. Today the couple run a cozy waterfront wine bar while the large building at Cottage Park has been transformed into a large scale winery in an event venue. In the proverbial, the rest is history. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right, so, but it wasn't as easy. Well, it was easy because you have some background in wineries. You didn't just wake up in the morning and say, I am going to make wine. Uh, making wine at home and making wine like this is very different. Very different. How is it different? Uh, well, you're making it in a lot larger volumes. Mm -hmm. You make a mistake, it costs a lot more money. Tens of thousands and of dollars. Made some mistakes. Among those mistakes also came great successes. Robert's distinctive wines have melded gold in competitions. So could we talk about some of the wines that you make here? What is your favorite wine? Uh, Bradford's Ghost. Okay, so could you tell us what to expect in that wine? It's a big, bold, heavy, tannic Bordeaux blend, which is my favorite. Which is your favorite. Yeah. It took him five years to make this wine, and it is only available to folks that belong to our wine cult. Wow. Yeah. So let's talk about actually the process of making wine. When you are thinking of the wine, actually not just the name, but the taste, tell me what goes into that process? How does it come about? <clears throat> Well, it depends on what kind of wine you want to make. Okay. Where, how do you get your ideas? You just go to, they come to you in your dreams? No, I mean, there's only so many <laughs> wine grapes. Okay. So there's only so many kinds of wine that you can make. Yeah. So I pretty much make what I like. And uh, I'm trying to push beyond that because that's some of the feedback we've gotten is that I don't, I'm not as passionate about the white wines as I am the red wines. Okay. So we're trying to put more emphasis on uh, making some high quality white wines now. The majority of 1620 wines are made of grapes from their vineyard in California. Now, when you're talking about grapes, how important are they in the wine making process? Can you blame a grape? You can say this was a terrible grape. That's why my <laughs> wine is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can't make good wine from a terrible grape, yeah. but you can make bad wine from a good grape. Okay. So the grapes are everything. You know, Mali, you often hear, eat locally, yeah. right? Uh, know where your foods are coming from, yeah. okay? That's very important. So in that idea, how does it connect to drink locally? Why is it important for somebody to come and purchase wine made here? Well, you're really suppo supporting local farmers. As Bob said, that we get some of our grapes from Westport Rivers and Westport, Massachusetts. You're really supporting local farmers when we can buy our grapes locally. And when you look at our bottling line, every single bottle of wine is done by hand. And Bob and I and our team touch every single bottle. We can only fill four bottles at a time. We can only cork one bottle at a time. So it is a very labor intensive process. So when you physically pick up that bottle of wine, and maybe the label's on a little bit crooked, that's from me to you with love. You know that a human being touched that bottle and it wasn't mass produced on a automated bottling line. Okay. Which makes a difference, because mm. you're buying mass produced wine, they're not, they're gonna put the, the legal limit of sulfur into the wine because they don't wanna have a problem with it being on the shelves for five years or mm. whatever. 
we do all the chemistry right here in the back room. We only put the minimal amount of sulfur in that it's going to take to keep the wine. So what is the proper way to taste wine? Well, you always want to do your swirl, sniff, and mm. sip. Because this Can I will... add one to that? Yes. You sniff, swirl, and then sniff again. So you just want... taste. So this wine will taste different when you drink it tomorrow because we've opened it and have had time to breathe. That's why they talk about decanting wine. So now you have one more reason to wine and dine in Plymouth. Thank you so much for joining me this morning for another Good Morning Wareham show. We are broadcasting live straight from our WCTV studio in Wareham. This is your source for local news, weather, traffic, and more information. And now for a moment in history, let's take a look at where we were today in history. Right. On this day in war history, the Nuremberg trials began in 1945. These hearings were held for two dozen high-ranking Nazi officials to decide how they should be charged for their crimes against humanity. American, Soviet, French, and British representatives all met in Nuremberg, Germany, to take part in the trials. After 10 months, 12 of the Nazis were killed, 7 were sentenced to prison, and 3 were acquitted. One of the others had committed suicide and another was deemed both physically and mentally incompetent, so he did not stand trial. Trials could continue throughout the 1950s for thousands more Nazis, leading to more than 5,000 convictions. On this day in whaling history, a sperm whale sunk a ship from Massachusetts in 1820. The Essex, uh, which came from Nantucket, was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean hunting for the high sought after sperm whale when an angry mare rammed the ship. The vessel capsized and 20 crew members were forced to, into, a three, sorry, into three lifeboats. They stayed on the seas for a total of 83 days, resorting to cannibalism. Only five men were able to make it to the shores of South America. Also today in driving history, the standard stoplight was created in 1923. Garrett Morgan, the son of slaves, patented the idea which was extremely novel since even though his was not the first traffic signal, it was the first to include an intermediate light as a warning to slow down. The yellow light that we have today was never used before. It was simply just stop and go system until Morgan made his useful invention. Also today, for birthday, shout out goes to former Vice President Joe Biden, who's currently running for uh, president, for 2020 presidential uh, race. Uh, he was born in 1942. He served as Obama's Vice President from 2009 and 2017. And happy birthday to everybody else celebrating their big day today. That is all for this morning today in history segment. To learn more cool historical facts, you can go online under history.com. Right now, the coffee segment is next, and we are going to take a look at Wilson's legacy, a story of a boat that galvanized a thousand to help Wilson's dream come to fruition. Take a look. For 
longer than three decades, the residents of Peabody witnessed a legacy in the making, a trimaran carved to a symbol that would unite a thousand. To hear the full story, I visited New Hampshire to meet Carl and Lisa. Wilson Labeo was my stepdad, married my mom about 18 years ago or so. And At Lowell Street in Peabody, Massachusetts, Wilson was building a 45-foot Roger Simpson trimaran, a lifelong project that started back in 1984 with the help of his father. And after 32 years in the making, a freak accident took Wilson's life, putting his dreams into a halt. So he was working in the backyard mm -hmm. and he was cutting brush right in front of the boat along the brook. And um, we don't really know totally exactly what happened. My mom called me and said he hadn't been in the house. And I said, well, call the police right away. Wilson died in August of 2017 at the age of 76. His wife Peggy died months later from an illness. Living behind was Wilson's unfinished dream, Foxy Lady. What did you guys know about the project? How invested were you? Well, that's, that's really why I was so passionate at the end here to get the boat done and to find a good home for the boat. Mm -hmm because I really wasn't very invested in the boat. And I felt really bad about that. Um, I think other family members and kids, other stepchildren that Wilson had growing up, probably put a lot of time into helping him with the boat. Tell us about what this boat, you said it meant so much to him. What was his vision? The boat is humongous. Yeah, yeah. so the boat, he, um, had studied different options to build. He wanted to obviously have um, have a boat that he could sail and race on the weekends. And um, he decided on that particular style of boat, the trimaran, because um, it gave him the ability to have a cruising boat mm -hmm. that he could, you know, um, take long trips on if he wanted to. But he could also race it on the weekends, and so. Um, he somehow came across some plans for this Roger Simpson design. You know, Wilson had a different idea in mind of what he wanted to do with the boat. Mm -hmm. So most people, I was told, build a, a foam boat, um, and this is a cold molded boat. Yeah. Nobody would really build a cold molded boat because it would take too much time and it would be too expensive, even though it's beautiful. Wilson's design exceeded every expectation. He shaped the, the hull into a different design and the wings and the armors are a different design. So when I actually started to research the boat to try to find one, mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything that looked like that boat. So you think of all the images on Google mm -hmm. of all the boats in the world and like you couldn't find another one like it. If you Google um, Roger Simpson, Leahona. Now you'll see Wilson's boat. So when you lost Wilson and then you lost your mother, mm -hmm. then the boat was left behind. And as right. you said, you knew he was working on it, but you weren't queuing in the, all the details, all the plans. Right. So to walk us the steps. You wanted to sell the boat, but we wanted to find the right person. Right. Well, you know, I just... You kind of walk out to the boat and you take it all in, you know, and you're like, oof, where do I start, right? And so you kind of look around inside the boat and see where he was at. So he had his wire list out and he had all his wiring tools and he was pulling wire and, and starting to wire everything up. And, um, you know, looking at the outside of the boat, you could see that it was weathered and at the point where it really needed attention on the outside. As beautiful as the boat was, Carl and Lisa were facing one big question. What to do with the boat? 
having no passion to own a boat nor the funds to finish and maintain the boat, they started looking for the one who would not only buy Wilson's boat, but see his dreams into fruition. It was kind of an odd duck. I was told many times, well, if you're going to find a trimaran person, you know, that's a needle in the haystack, you know, because it takes a special person that's going to want that boat. The clock was ticking faster than they could manage. They had a year to make a decision. One of the last people that was really serious that was on the boat um, from like um, October, November of last year into May of this year, um, he had come and sort of done his survey, cleaned up the boat, helped reorganize everything, and, and then he was actually looking at another boat mm. to take a look at the rigging to see how he was going to rig that, that, this boat. Mm -hmm. And they offered him that boat for the cost of the move. So when he backed out at the, end, at the beginning of June, we were like devastated because we had just let him go the entire winter without advertising the boat to anybody else or working with anybody else to take the boat. And this time, the boat was still at the property, right? Correct. Yes. And you guys had already sold the house. Right. right. Yeah, so yeah. we had till August 10th to get the boat out of the property, or we would have to salvage it and split the proceeds with the owner of the house. Yeah. So you were looking for somebody, the right person. You thought you found the right person. You stopped advertising. That deal fell through. Right. Now you're desperate. Right. But there was a gentleman before Garth that we, we weren't quite sure about. He was young, he was 24, had a lot of passion. He worked at a boatyard, did fiberglass work, that sort of thing. Mm. He was an Eagle Scout. His name was Jesse from Maine. And Jesse had big plans for the boat. Um, and he actually had invested um, you know, money into the final survey. Mm. He invested money into the boat move because he had to have a deposit down. Mm. So we felt really bad for Jesse. He ran into some financial issues like a week before the boat was supposed to move and said that he couldn't do it. And I, and, and I had gone down to visit with Tim. So Tim was a homeowner. Mm. Um, we sat down on the back deck and I said, so Tim, we're not gonna make the 10th. What would you like to do? You want to cut the boat up, salvage it? He said, nope. He goes, we can't cut that boat up. He said, Wilson will haunt me the rest of my life. <laughs> and I said, OK. <laughs> so we, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> I, he said, try to find another person to take the boat. You were at his mercy. Yeah, you, right? absolutely, yeah. yeah. And with the opportunity, Carl and Lisa went back to the old list, looking at those who had shown earnest interest. Um, I was just going on all the Facebook pages that had those, and we basically at that point had come up with um, the idea that we would give the boat away if so somebody free. would pay to move it. To move it. And finish it and not salvage it. Uh, yeah. That so was, you got, was it a desperate uh, decision or what was it? Well, we were told that the boat needed like fifty to $75,000 worth of work. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it only fair to whoever the potential buyer, taker, if you will, even though we weren't selling, but whoever was going to take the boat needed to have at least that jump start, mm -hmm. um, you know, with... Uh, just the investment of the move mm -hmm. in order to kind of make it feasible. Mm -hmm. But what needed to go along with that would be the knowledge to do it because you really, if you paid somebody to do all the work on the boat, you might spend a couple hundred thousand and the boat would never be worth a couple hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So who would do that? They phoned not only one person, but two, Dave and Court. It could have maybe gone either way. Mm -hmm. I think Wilson's craftsmanship and the uniqueness of the boat and the whole story really got to David. You know, it's like he saw the passion that Wilson, you know, had put into the boat with the construction. 
and just, I think, deep down inside, being a boat guy, he said, no, this boat can't get cut up. And so the challenge began, the actual logistics, to how they will move a 32-year-old boat off the property. Since Wilson's boat was wider than the traditional trimarans, the permit to transport it would have to come straight from the governor's office. Maybe about three weeks before we were going to move the boat, I got a call from Cindy at Brownell, the boat moving company, and she said, we got a little bit of a problem. The boat's 30 feet wide and mass DOT only allows 16 foot wide loads over the road. Through the connection of an old friend, Carr was able to get in touch with Senator Tarr's office, which then he was connected with the head of Massachusetts Department of Transportation. And Mr. Uh, Fody wrote back and he said, Mr. Hanselman, he said, I've lived on the North Shore a good part of my life and I've traveled down Lowell Street and I know exactly where your boat is and when you guys are ready to move your boat, we'll have your permit. While the planning was taking place, Wilson's boat was garnering attraction of its own. Neighbors and strangers sharing their memories of Wilson and what the boat meant to them. So when the moving day was scheduled, Carl, Lisa, David, and Court found themselves surrounded with strangers eager to help. That was surreal. You just can't imagine, like, the the events in those two days, right? So it started on Tuesday morning with the crane. Yeah. And so the excitement of lifting that boat like 65 feet up in the air and over the top of the trees was like, what's gonna happen? What if they drop the boat? It had never moved out of that spot, like for 30, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so just to see it move from that spot to the driveway was a big deal. And just to see how big it was when it was up in the air coming down beside that barn was like, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, it's huge. It was like you thought it was just gonna go right on top of the barn. It was so big. Yeah. My son and um, my son-in-law, Keenan, we stopped because they had to drop signs for the boat to go by. The hulls were so wide when it went up onto 128. So as the boat went by, we ran out, put the signs back up and screwed them back together. So we were sort of following the boat along. And there it was, a moment 32 years in the making, Wilson's boat touching the water. For me, it was a bigger deal watching the rudder hit the water because that was like the first thing that touched the water. Everybody was excited when it floated in the water and stuff. I was just like, this boat just to touch the water is incredible, right? So um, that was a big deal for me. I yelled when the rudder hit the water, but um, it finally eased down into the water. For now, we're going to take it down to Marathon, Florida in the Middle Keys, and we'll probably spend a year, maybe two, making, making everything complete. Um, you know, when, when Wilson died, everything was left unfinished. Um, so much has been done, but there's still a lot of work to do. So, but uh, even as she is now, just under motor without the sails, um, I would still take her out on day trips or you know, local things in the Keys. Um, she's got a fantastic motor. She's a lot of fun on the water, so I, uh, I don't feel like I have to wait for it to be done before she can start seeing some adventures. Well, we, we have been looking for a, a larger vessel, and this boat suits pretty much any and all, all of our needs for what we want to do sailing and cruising. And the, the, like I said, the, the craftsmanship of the build was, was so well done that 
and, and a possibility of if nobody took it, it could be cut up and you know parts the engine salvaged and all the, all those years of work and would just go right down the drain. So uh, I felt the need to save the boat from from the landfill. When you got the boat, what did you have to do in order to get into the water for the first time? Ooh, that's a long list. Uh, we did a lot of uh, fiberglass repair. Well, we spent ten days working on the boat mostly every night till midnight and we'd get up and, and I was chilly here so we'd get up around eight and start at it again and when they came for the boat uh, to, to transport it to the launch ramp at 1 30 in the morning we were we were still working on it and we we're like holy cow we're out of time <laughs> so we got to the launch ramp and, and worked a few and eh, maybe another hour or so and we got about two hours of sleep and that got up and started working again even uh, Right when they were ready to launch, I was I was still installing like the the strainer for the water intake for the engine. I'd like, forgotten the about. And we had we had uh, it was a variable pitch three blade prop, and we had one of the blades backwards. And one of the crew members of Brownell, uh, the transport crew, had noticed that. So they focused on that and got that proper for us because we were just so tired we we couldn't even brain it. <laughs> I could look at instructions and just go. Eh. This is, this is definitely something that um, an individual would craft. This is more artwork than factory. Where do you, where are some places that you could point out to say this is pure Wilson? Um, the bones in the boat. Um, he put in an escape hatch and that's cool in and of itself. But anywhere where we might take water from, say, an open window mm. or um, something like that, instead of it, it running all the way down or sitting on the ledge, he drilled holes so that it it runs down and instead of staying on. So he 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 thought of all the contingencies for if this happens and if that happens and. Uh, <laughs> How long do you think this boat will last? To answer that question, easily 30 years, even though this boat is already like 32 years into its build. It was, I think the first 15 years, it was built inside a building and then assembled three pieces into one. And then it was, it was, it was tarped and covered for, for winter, which really helped. Even uh, Carl and Lisa, uh, after Wilson's passing, they would cover the boat for the winter to keep the, the, the rain and snow and whatnot off of it. So that really that really helped save this boat. If it was just left out, uncovered, it would not be in the shape that it's in now. Both of your hearts are rest to know that you have done Wilson proud and you have honored his wishes. Do you do you feel more at peace? I, I, I do, I, for sure, because I, I felt like that w I couldn't really relax or think about a lot of other stuff um, until that boat was sort of safe and moved and knew it was going to continue its life. I just felt like um, I had to, had to do it. And, People said that they couldn't believe that we put that much time and effort into it and all the hurdles and everything that we went through. Looking back on it now, of course it was well worth it, you know? It was a, uh, I, I said, aside from raising, um, you know, two great kids and my family and everything else, maybe one of the most important things that I ever did in my life was save that boat passionate about it, you know, and, um, and yeah, not having spent as much time with Wilson as I, I should have, I, you made it up. I felt like, you know, a lot of people worked on the boat, a lot of people invested a lot of time, but Lisa and I got it in the water, and I just felt like that was our contribution to the boat. The yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, felt sad that, you know, Wilson never got to see the boat in the water or ne never got to sail his boat. But I just really feel like that was, that was his mission on Earth, was to build that boat, just to touch all the people that he touched along the way.
Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, Wilson's Legacy Story, you can follow it on Facebook. They have Wilson's Legacy Trauma Run Facebook page. It is a public page. You can just ask to join in and you can follow the story from the start to where it is today. You can even track the boat, Dave and Court, where they are, uh, their experiences and how the renovations are going. There is also a GoFundMe page dedicated for this particular mission, which if you choose to join, um, you can also do that. Um, we will continue playing this story, but it's such a remarkable piece. Um, it's so rare to find stories such as this, and I'm so glad to hear and to see that Wilson's dream finally came to fruition. So once again, if you want to follow this story, you can join the Facebook page that is Wilson's Legacy Trauma Run page on Facebook. If you missed us this morning, this particular show will air this evening at 6 p.m. And we'll also go on our YouTube page, Wareham Community Television on YouTube. We'll be back here on Friday with more. Thank you, Wareham. Have a pleasant day. Bye.